Here I had this scary illness and having the doctor say, oh, you have cancer. I thought, sure, that my life was over or whatever. So you think all those scary things, right? But it truly has a silver lining. Now I have better contact with family and friends. We're writing each other more. Just uh, the my quality of my uh, relationships with family and friends just took a big step up. I'm Deborah Jarvis, and you are listening to The Final Say, conversations with people facing death. This is the podcast where you can get comfortable talking about death and learn some things about life from people who are facing death. Now, in this episode, I'm talking with Harlan Young. We're going to find out how facing a terminal illness can actually improve your social life. We'll ask the question, is it possible to go from being an introvert to being an extrovert? We'll also talk about coping with limitations, finding new joy, and how sometimes the hardest thing about your own death is not your own death, but thinking about how it will affect your family and friends. Harlan had lymphoma 12 years ago, but now it's progressed to myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS, and I'll let him explain it. So um, so now I have what's known as MDS. Basically, it's failing bone marrow. It's just that my bone marrow is increasingly producing less and less of the three main things it does, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. They just said it will progress. It's kind of complicated, but they have a chart. And you can see on the chart that, well, okay, I'll live one year and then I'll die, or maybe I'll live two years and I'll die. But the main thing is you're not going to cure it. What was it like for you when you realized, okay, I'm going to die from this? Well, uh, except for the occasional waking up in the middle of the night, kind of fearful and feeling down about it, the great majority of the time, I, I accept it. You're just doing your life. Yeah. Even back during my lymphoma time, I remember talking to friends and saying, you know, I've had a wonderful life already to age 60. I've had a wonderful, active life. I have so much I'm thankful for. A lot of singing years and decades of singing. So if I get out of this, it's just gravy. But if I don't, I will have had a wonderful life. Well, so then fast forward to now I'm 73 and oh my gosh, I had another 12 years of life. So I even feel more like that. What's been the hardest thing about all of this right now? Hmm. I guess the hardest thing is a few months ago, I was miserable all the time. And I was still in treatments. So my energy was way down. My interest in doing anything was way down. My, I had no interest in eating. That always makes me feel bad. It's, when you look at food and you just don't want to eat it, you know, I lost 15 pounds during that time. And so I thought, well, they did give me the treatment and I got extra months of life, just like the doctor said, but it has to come to an end. And then when the treatments aren't working for you anymore and you're starting to feel bad and your counts are going down, but not coming up like they're supposed to, I guess this is the way it is. It's just the rocky slide to the end. What gives you comfort and strength throughout this whole experience? The main thing, really, that does give me comfort and strength is this whole new life that I have as a social person. How do you explain that? Is it your meds or is it... Well, I, first of all, because I couldn't do any more physical stuff that I like to do, I can't travel in an airplane. I can't go to restaurants, you know, theaters, da, da, da. So I'm kind of confined to home most of the time. And so people from the church and especially from the choir and family and other friends, they were all reaching out and we thinking of you and best wishes. And so actually they kind of started the ball rolling that, wow, all these people, they're just, they're just so wonderful and so caring. And so I would 
get back to them and say, ah, oh, hey, we can come over and visit and we can come over and bring food. And so that just snowballed. And now, oh my gosh, that's the main part of my life now. From going from an introvert who just wanted to mainly go skiing to now I'm just entertaining every week. You're an Family introvert. And I, well, I don't know if I'll go that far, <laughs> but I act like an extrovert. That's certainly true. It's really kind of amazing that I have I've completely kind of changed the focus of my life uh, to, well, it's what I can do. And it's worked so well. I never imagined that such a thing would happen, that, oh, I'd be stuck at home. I would just have to work puzzles and games and read books. And maybe somebody would come over and visit me sometime. Well, I hardly ever have time for reading and doing puzzles because we're either going to somebody else's house to visit or they're coming over here. So that is, that's making my life wonderful right now. Great. I'm just wondering if I'll be able to hang on to as much positive enthusiasm as I have now. Now, one thing that, that helps, that gives me a good uh, feeling about that is I took care of my mom in a nursing home, or I mean, I had her in a nursing home for a number of years and went and visited her all the time. And she was wheelchair bound and osteoporosis. And she, oh my gosh, she had such a long list of things. But every time I went to meet her, she was happy. And she, here she is in such a grim circumstance and environment. And yet, she was always bubbly and happy, and I'm just thinking, you know, Mom, I hope I got the genetic code from you for that, because that's where I want to be when I'm miserable. What are your beliefs around death? Ooh. I mean, in your gut. I know what they tell us to believe, but where are you with that? Oh, you may not like the answer. Even though I've been going to church for 30 years. I like all of Oh, okay. I just think it's dust to dust. You die, and, and that's the end. It'll just be the same as for all the billions of years before you were born. There'll be nothingness. You'll just be dust. So heaven is just a nice concept that people like to cling to, but... It doesn't work for me. I'm an engineer. And I used to believe in it all when I was growing up. I went to church. I believed it all. You know, wow, God and heaven and all those things. But by the time I became a young adult and looked around more at the world and studied my engineering and all that sort of stuff. So I was very skeptical. Now, I love going to the mountains. I have kind of a spiritual thing with nature, mountains, the beauty of the world. I, I got all that. But as far as a God being out there somewhere who cares what's going on down here on earth, I, sorry, I just can't buy that. <laughs> you know, by the way, I think Jesus is a terrific character. I'm all completely. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Jesus. Okay, so I'm up at the God thing. Uh, you know, I see, and I've been going to church for 30 years, I've been seeing what wonderful effects it has on so many people over the decades. Man, it's a good thing. Church is a wonderful thing. So I'm very, very high on the church, very high on churches in general. If it works for you and really brings you joy and happiness, oh, you're a lucky guy or woman. What would you want someone to know who has gotten a terminal diagnosis and is very fearful? What would you want them to know? The main thing I think I would say is you have to just look for new joy in what you can do. You've got to let go of the things that now your new circumstances prevent you from doing. And it won't be like your former life. You know, you just have to kind of come to grips with that. But rather than just go into a hole and say, I can't do what I used to do, and so I can't stand it anymore, and I'm just gonna, I'm just going to feel sorry for myself all the time. But if you can resist that, people is the number one thing to go to. I mean, that's certainly what's happened to me, is I have discovered being social. Like I say, it's really quite remarkable. How has it changed your relationship with Kathy? It's always been good. And it continues to be very good. Now, there's more work for her because she's always going to the hospital with me, and sometimes she has to drive me. These days, I'm able to drive myself, but we still, she always goes with me. And so 
certainly there's an impact there, but she has assured me that she's dedicated to doing this and that she feels good about it and she wants to carry on this fight with me. And so I'm trying to take her at her word, but sometimes when I look at her, she looks sad. How is it for you when you think about leaving Kathy, when you die? Oh. It's almost unbearable. Because I'll leave her alone. Every once in a while that thought comes to me. and Because I know if she were dying and then she left, I'd come home and the house would be empty. She wouldn't be here. And I would just... I don't like to think about it because it, it's painful. Now, she has a wonderful network of family, friends, the church, and so I know she'll get through it. And gosh, people by the thousands are doing it every day, right, around the world, getting through the loss of your loved one, your spouse, or whatever. And so it can be done, and I know she'll do it, but I know... I know that initially she'll be in grief because I'll be dead. It won't hurt me, <laughs> but she will be still feeling it. And that, that really, oh, yeah, I, I don't like to think about that at all. Man, that idea of leaving her, that really does cause me great pain. It's the most painful thing that I can really think of. Have you ever had people who have died visit you in your dreams or anything like that? Oh, well, sure. I have a twin. I had a twin brother. Really? Yeah. He died tragically in an auto accident in 2008. So, of course, I was devastated. And, uh, you know, I mean, I got through it, but it was tough because beside being my twin brother, he was my number one soulmate. We could communicate like nobody else had ever communicated with. And so that was, that was a terrible loss. He was just about to retire, and we had all kinds of plans of traveling and spending more time together because he lived down in California, so I didn't see him on a regular basis. So, yeah, so that loss, well, as you can imagine, I certainly did have dreams with him in it for a long time after. I don't think I, I rarely do anymore. What was his name? Doug. Doug. Yeah, Doug Young. When you dreamed about Doug, was it? Lesson, or did he have anything to say to you, or do you remember? Jeez. I don't, but I can just categorically say that just all dreams are weird. Nothing normal happens in a dream. If I wake up and am actually aware of a dream that I've been having, oh, that's so weird. <laughs> that's really, that's how I sum up dreams. They're all weird. There's no normal dream. <laughs> okay, hold everything, hold everything. I think dreams are supposed to be weird. It's exactly their strangeness that makes us contemplate them and think about them and try to find meaning in them. But I don't know. I guess there's those of us who think they're just plain weird. But I invite you to stay open to your dreams. Stay curious. Be curious and see if there's anything that your dream might offer you. Well, what would you want people to know who are afraid to come visit people who are very ill? They're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I'd like to try to talk them into going and getting through that and going to visit them that almost certainly they will have a positive impact on that person. Uh, just because, again, of all the wonderful connections I've had with people. I mean, I think connections with people, that's really where it's at. Before you got sick, was it difficult for you to visit people who were extremely ill and facing death? Hmm. You know, it might have been. Funny how I have a new perspective on it now. I think I have a better attitude about that yeah. now. Who do you have the deepest conversations with about dying and death and sickness and all of that? It might be the men's group. 
Harlan was attending a support group at his church led by Peter, one of the ministers there. And there were about, I think, three or four men in the group, all of them that had different diagnoses and all of them who were facing death. I think maybe the men's group is the main place where I really talk about how things are really going and how am I facing things. And how is that for you? Do you feel good after you leave or... You know, how is it for you to be in that group and talk about these issues? Because it's pretty unusual in our culture to do that. Yeah, well, it is. I feel very good about them. And of course, the men's group is kind of a prepare thing. You know, we're working around a, a very big, thick book written by a guy who did palliative care doctor for a decade. What's the book? It's called Die Wise. Oh, I've got a copy of it. Yeah. He read the book and he said, This is marvelous. Everybody should read this and learn how to. Focus your life in your final months or whatever so that instead of just being a miserable wretch, you, know, <laughs> you can die feeling good about your life and the world and not being a miserable wretch. Because it sounds like you've managed to find joy in every day. Every day, absolutely. I love every day. And I want it to go as long as it will. I'm having really a, quite a great life. So here's my final say for today. I'm glad Harlan reminded us to look for joy and beauty every day. And I know sometimes that's really hard, but I found that just the mere act of searching or being open to finding joy and beauty changes everything. Now, Harlan mentioned the book Die Wise. It's truly a really good book, and it's by Stephen Jenkinson, and you can get it wherever books are sold. And I also want to give you a heads up that the organization Compassion and Choices is having a virtual event where you can hear some great stories and meet some civil rights icons and pioneers of the whole movement. And that's all happening on October 27th. And I'll put a link for that event in the transcript of this episode. Which reminds me, if you have any feedback or questions or ideas or stories, hop on over to the website, thefinalsaypodcast.com, and let me know. Or just let me know how you're doing. This has been The Final Say, Conversations with People Facing Death. I'm your host, Deborah Jarvis. Which brings me to the fact that several people have asked me why I don't run credits at the end. So here they are. The Final Say is hosted, produced, edited, marketed, and angsted over by me, Deborah Jarvis. Thanks, as always, to Blue Dot Sessions, who provided the music. And thanks to my husband, who's always willing to listen to the rough cut and give me feedback. I hope you find joy and beauty in your day today. Connections with people, that's really where it's at. <laughs>